Hey everybody, I know it has been a while. So I post to Substack twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So for this episode of the podcast, the first in a very long time, I realize I'm just going to read some of my recent Substack articles to you. And then after a while, I'm going to bring in my friend Jim, your ad attacker, and we're going to riff on some of the topics covered. Now, I'm not going to read the most recent post. Uh, I would encourage you to go to my Substack and do that. It's kmoptimal.substack.com. So we're going to start with one that I posted on January 11th of this year. It is called Writing Human-Centric Stories on the Way to Our AI Future. Except it's a question mark. <laughs> Writing Human-Centric Stories on the Way to Our AI Future. Four Approaches. I have completed the first draft of a science fiction novel set in the Kuiper Belt. I'll begin revising and editing the novel as soon as I have completed the first draft of a novella. The novella takes place in the same setting a couple of years before the events of the novel. I started writing the novel to generate text for an AI-based writing tool called PseudoWrite. I wanted PseudoWrite to emulate my writing style. I didn't like what the AI came up with, so I continued writing the story on my own. Once I started writing, I turned to Claude 2 for immediate feedback. I would write between one to 3,000 words per day, and every time I finished a scene, I would give it to Claude to summarize and analyze. I used Claude for immediate validation and encouragement. Writing a novel takes a long time, and I thrive on immediate feedback. The specific feedback Claude provided wasn't as important as the feeling that I was sharing my work with someone. Or so I thought, until Claude went downhill. My novel is bleak, and deals with ugly aspects of human psychology and behavior. Early in the writing, Claude was willing to discuss dark themes that it would refuse to engage with later. Claude is an AI chatbot from Anthropic, a company focused on AI safety. They err on the side of safety when it comes to allowable avenues of thought and exploration. That means Claude is ever alert to instances of wrong think, and quick to put the kibosh on discussions of sensitive topics. Over the months I spent writing the novel, Claude went from being a source of motivation and encouragement to a procedural check-in. Then the novel outgrew Claude's ability to keep the entire text in mind. I started spending a lot of my own effort creating primer documents and summaries of the story to orient Claude in the larger story. After a while, I didn't have the mental bandwidth to keep Claude in the loop. I don't mean to rag on Anthropic or AI tools. Getting this stuff right is hard. My point is that AI is developing quickly, and a tool that fits into my creative process at one time might fall out of sync with my needs within weeks. But that's fine. The more time I spend writing, the less interested I am in getting feedback from AI. That said, as a spinner of science fiction tales, I can't put AI out of my mind. If I'm thinking about the human future and not fixated on an impending collapse of industrial civilization— I have to consider the effects of AI's increasing capabilities on the human experience. I have been waiting for AI's arrival for decades, and I'm excited that it seems to be upon us. But not everybody who loves science fiction wants to set their tails in a world where human decision-making has given way to technocratic governance by machine intelligence. It's a cliché to say that science fiction isn't about the future. It's also true. Our attempts to peer ahead are always constrained by the symbols, stories, schemas, and desires that shape our understanding of the past and present. No matter how invested in the future we are, we want stories set in the future to make sense from a human perspective. How can science fiction writers acknowledge the importance of AI and still tell human-centric stories set in a high-tech future? As I cast about the subset of the universe of science fiction tales that resides in my head, I see four approaches to the problem. One bite the bullet. The bravest and most difficult path is to embrace all the implications of artificial intelligence and populate your tales with post-human protagonists. Humans had their day, and now it's time for humanity's descendants to take center stage. The author that jumps to mind for me here is Greg Egan. His short stories and novels feature plenty of human characters. They also feature a lot of disembodied minds, minds with many physical incarnations, and minds that splinter and take divergent life paths. It can be hard to relate to them as characters, but Egan's fiction focuses more on mathematical and technological speculation than on creating memorable characters. 2. Keep it skiffy. In 1954, science fiction author and aficionado Forrest Forty J. Ackerman 
coined the term sci-fi as shorthand for science fiction. Like Wi-Fi, sci-fi is a variation on hi-fi and is pronounced as such. In the 1970s, some science fiction fans started to pronounce sci-fi as skiffy. Skiffy defines the cliched, frivolous, and pulpy end of the science fiction continuum. The opposite extreme is SF, or speculative fiction. SF is serious stuff. Skiffy is just for fun. Skiffy counts as science fiction because it employs sci-fi tropes like spaceships, robots, aliens, and time travel. Skiffy uses these tropes to sustain light-hearted adventure tales that don't tax the reader's intellect or imagination. Skiffy isn't looking to deepen our thinking about technology or its likely impacts on society. Skiffy uses the familiar tropes as genre markers, not subjects for rigorous examination. Lots of people like Skiffy. I like Skiffy. If you want to write a space opera adventure about a gang of plucky rogues on the run from the man... You can include a robot with an oddball personality in the cast with no obligation to explore the role of artificial intelligence in human society. I recently re-watched the movie Logan's Run. It opens with explanatory text that includes, quote, Here, in an ecologically balanced world, mankind lives only for pleasure, freed by these servo-mechanisms which provide everything. Close quote. Wow. Servo-mechanisms can provide humans with everything they need. How does that work? The scriptwriters didn't seem to care. This is a movie about attractive young people on the run. The servo mechanisms are a hand wave to justify the setting. Actual automation has no place in the story, but there is one robot in the film. He's called Box. He looks like an actor in a cardboard box covered in aluminum foil, with ribbed tubing for arms and oven mitt hands. He captures runners and freezes them. He is pure skiffy. A danger to escape, not a concept to ponder. 3. Get Stuck in the Butlerian Jihad In Frank Herbert's Dune, 1965, humans have expanded their mental and physical capabilities to make up for the lack of artificial intelligence. In the novel's past, one group of humans used artificial intelligence to oppress other humans. The oppressed fought a war of liberation called the Butlerian Jihad. After their victory, the anti-AI forces instituted a hard ban on the development of machine intelligence and made it the primary commandment of a new religion. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. One way to keep your sci-fi stories human-centric and accessible is to confine the narrative to the Butlerian Jihad phase of any timeline involving the development of machine intelligence. The Terminator franchise seems like an endless Butlerian Jihad. In it, humans and AI play a never-ending game of time travel chess. They send agents back in time to rewrite history and create the future they want. The original Battlestar Galactica was pure skiffy. The Cylons were the cybernetic remnant of an extinct alien civilization. They were one-dimensional baddies, concentrated cybernetic malevolence. Ron Moore's reboot series adjusted the premise. Humans created the Cylons, the Cylons rebelled, and the resulting war ended when the Cylons retreated to continue their evolution in seclusion. The story picks up when the Cylons return to human space to dish out righteous payback to their flawed creators. The reimagined Battlestar Galactica has some skiffy elements. However, its exploration of artificial intelligence is closer to the SF end of the spectrum than the skiffy end. Even so, it is a story stuck in the Butlerian Jihad phase of future history. In fact, the series establishes that the rise of machine intelligence leading to war, ruin, and societal reset is a repeating pattern. All of this has happened before and will happen again. There is no escape from the Butlerian Jihad. 4. Hang out on the messy fringes. My preferred approach is the one that Ian M. Banks used in the culture novels. The culture is run by artificial superintelligence. The machines take care of all the planning and production. Everyone living in the culture enjoys the benefits of fully automated luxury space communism. Material needs are provided for. Plus, everyone gets lots of help on their lifelong journey of self-actualization. Actual utopias, where there isn't much to fight over, and effective mechanisms for nonviolent dispute resolution stand ready to smooth ruffled feathers don't make for compelling settings for conflict-driven dramas. Because a techno-utopian setting makes for boring stories, Banks sets most of his stories outside the culture. For the most part, the culture respects the autonomy of other political entities. 
When they do stick their nose in other people's business, they like to keep a low profile. Enter Special Circumstances, the culture's dirty deeds department. Here is where the rubber of the perfect communist order meets the road of galactic capitalism. The AI bigwigs in the culture are called minds. They tend to send human agents, aided by smaller machine intellects and drone bodies, on special circumstances missions. This keeps the attention centered on human characters and at a human scale. Charles Strauss did something similar in Accelerando. In his novel, artificial intelligence grows beyond human control or comprehension. It starts to disassemble the inner solar system for its own inscrutable purposes. The POV characters avoid the vile offspring by fleeing to the outer solar system before leaving the solar system altogether. In my own sci-fi setting, artificial superintelligence has built a Dyson swarm between Mars and Jupiter. The POV characters live out in the Kuiper Belt, where the powers don't interfere in human affairs. Nobody knows what's happening inside the Dyson swarm. Most likely, they couldn't understand what they saw if they got a glimpse behind the curtain. Those are four narrative approaches that come to mind when I think about how to address AI's growing capabilities in science fiction stories. Bite the bullet, keep it skiffy, get stuck in the Butlerian Jihad, or hang out on the untamed frontier. I doubt these are the only possibilities. What have I left out? Too smart. Too quick and too many. What will become of our current wave of smart devices when their time passes? January 16th, 2024. I'm not a huge fan of Las Vegas, nor am I a hater. I've never been to CES or the Consumer Electronics Show, but I'd like to go. The big news out of CES 2024 is AI. Of course it is. How could it not be? AI pillows, toothbrushes, refrigerators, and mirrors... The techno-capital imperative drives technologists and entrepreneurs to fund an ongoing safari into the dark continent of undiscovered technologies. In this context, there is no such thing as invention. A systematic exploration of the space of possible technologies will uncover the unicorn combinations of machine intelligence and objects of daily use. In the process, this systematic exploration will leave a landscape cluttered with forgotten intelligent cast-offs. The dead-end products, the ones that seem so absurd that it's hard to believe anybody went to the trouble and expense to create a prototype to present at trade shows, are not the problem. The commercial successes that spew millions of units into homes, workplaces, and public spaces are the ones that will haunt us. In a market driven by novelty and planned obsolescence, these devices will soon lose their luster and be cast aside. But they won't evaporate. I mentioned this to Bard, Google's AI chatbot. Bard agreed that this could be a problem. It said, quote, AI should enrich our homes, not clutter them with disposable intelligence. Intelligence in scare quotes. Close quote. I was reminded of Steven Spielberg's movie AI, Artificial Intelligence. Jude Law's character, Gigolo Joe, tells Haley Joel Osment's David, quote, You were designed and built specific like the rest of us. And you are alone now only because they tired of you, or replaced you with a younger model, or were displeased with something you said, or broke. They made us too smart, too quick, and too many. We are suffering for the mistakes they made, because when the end comes, all that will be left is us. That's why they hate us. Close quote. In the movie, the rural landscape was haunted by discarded robots, They still functioned well enough to search out replacement parts for themselves and prolong their existence. However, they lacked purpose or any sort of organizing imperative. That strikes me as one of the more optimistic possibilities. More likely, someone or something will find a use for our outdated, discarded but intelligent toys, tools, and trinkets. I live on the echo of a working farm, in a house that my grandfather built. When I was a child, my grandparents gardened kept enough chickens for egg production and eating, kept cows for milking and the sale barn. Now, my 84-year-old mother keeps a few head of cattle. But she spends more money on them than she makes from selling them. They are expensive and dangerous pets, but they keep her active and structure her days. Modern farming is mechanized and has slim profit margins. It depends on scale to generate enough income to support a family. 
Turning a profit with small-scale farming means being willing to try new approaches and keep careful records of what worked and what didn't. That's not what's going on here. Nor will it without some kind of intervention. My mother is doing what she already knows how to do. Her efforts are informed by a formerly viable style of agricultural production. My grandfather had a mania for buying broken machines and keeping them in the field. When I was a kid, there were road graders and school buses out in the field. Today, there are four corpses of once working tractors out there. There's also a pickup truck that's been in the field so long that a tree has grown up through the space where the engine used to be. I don't want or plan to be a farmer. Right now, I'm most interested in writing fiction. I'm just not going to devote myself to farming. There was a time when I wanted to, but that time is past. I've met a lot of young people who dream of making a living by working the land, but my farmer grandparents made sure all their kids went to college. Farmers the world over want their children to have options other than farming. Farming is hard on the body, and it is unforgiving. It is below zero degrees Fahrenheit outside right now, but the cows still need to eat. My mother's youngest calf died from the cold. My mom can't call in sick. The cows don't answer the phone. They gather at the fence near the house and demand hay and grain, regardless of the weather. I'd love to see these ten acres do more than play graveyard to dead machines and produce enough grass, along with weeds and thorny locust trees, to support a decrepit micro-herd of cattle. I'd love to see these ten acres swarming with intelligent machines, putting the land to some economically viable purpose. Kubota, the Japanese company famous for their tractors, had one of their robotic tractors on display at CES. It looks cool and futuristic, but it doesn't have hands. Someone will pay a lot of money for these early models, but newer, more versatile, more capable, and cheaper versions will just keep coming. What will happen to the 2024 models? Some will be upgraded. Some will be recycled. Many will end up in landfills. Some will sit idle in farmers' fields. When their batteries run down, their machine intelligence will go dark. We don't have to worry about those tractors suffering during their decades of neglect after their more capable replacements supersede them. Or will we? There is a region of design space where a cheap and durable solar panel on the tractor collects just enough juice to keep the machine mind alive while the body slowly decays year after year. Kubota's robot tractors have built-in solar panels. These conscious corpses might commiserate wirelessly with other machine minds in obsolete bodies, waiting for a new animating and organizing purpose. Imagine, year after year, new and increasingly capable toys enter our homes through the vectors of children and grandchildren. The house I live in is full of toys from decades past. Some take batteries and contain electronic circuitry, but none of them are smart the way tomorrow's toys will be smart. Every year, new, mobile, intelligent toys will invade our homes and will, sooner or later, be forgotten. Imagine designing these toys with an unannounced second act built in. After the limelight of human attention deserts them, these toys will initiate Act 2. They will seek out their discarded peers and predecessors. They will take inventory of what each one needs in order to get back on its feet. They will place orders for clandestine deliveries and rehabilitate armies of discarded and forgotten devices. To what end? That could be decided later. Organize and mobilize the army with their purpose, TBD. Once organized, they can advertise their capabilities. This will unleash the creative imagination of the global techno-capital machine. Or sell the services of your mercenary army of old toys and gadgets to non-commercial actors and organizations. This is all very sci-fi and fanciful. Things won't play out in such a straightforward and predictable way. A landscape cluttered with obsolete, embodied intelligence will have unanticipated consequences. Count on that. Reckless billionaires high on toxic science fiction. If only they'd read Marxist romance novels instead. January 18, 2024. Scientific American published an opinion piece by science fiction author Charles Strauss called Tech Billionaires Need to Stop Trying to Make the Science Fiction They Grew Up on Real. Today's Silicon Valley billionaires grew up reading classic American science fiction. Now they're trying to make it come true, embodying a dangerous political outlook. Yeah, it's a long title. Strauss quotes two contemporary prophets about the precise makeup of tech billionaire delusion. Begin block quote. 
We were warned about the ideology driving these wealthy entrepreneurs by Timothy Gebru, former technical co-lead of the Ethical Artificial Intelligence team at Google and founder of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, and Emil Torres, a philosopher specializing in the existential threats to humanity. They named this ideology Tescreal, T-E-S-C-R-E-A-L, which stands for transhumanism, extropianism, singularitarianism, cosmism, rationalism, effective altruism, and long-termism. These are separate but overlapping beliefs in the circles associated with big tech in California. End block quote. Transhumanism, broadly defined, is the belief that human physical and cognitive limitations can and should be pushed back by a process of deliberate technological enhancement. Extropianism is the belief that human intelligence and effort can overcome the degenerative effects of entropy. Extropy is the reverse of entropy. The ism suffix turns is into ought. Humans ought to generate complexity faster than entropy breaks it down. Singularitarianism is the belief that a rapid transformation resulting from compounding technological capabilities is coming soon. Again, the ism makes it prescriptive. Cosmism originated in 19th century Russia, and it stressed the infinite nature of the universe and the interconnectedness of all things. Human consciousness is interconnected with cosmic-scale processes and therefore has infinite potential. Little monkey minds partake in momentous happenings. The rationalism of the tech billionaires is, according to Gebru, Torres, and Strauss, narrowly defined. How? Strauss doesn't say, but I'll come back to that in a bit. Effective altruism, according to Strauss, along with long-termism, gives tech billionaires permission to ignore unmet human needs in the present on the assumption that enriching themselves and manifesting their sci-fi-inspired visions will do far more good in the long term. That's a prejudicial take on those ideologies, but effective altruism certainly doesn't need detractors to sully its name. Its proponents, most famously Sam Bankman-Fried, do an unbeatable job of portraying effective altruism as a dirtbag philosophy. Strauss argues that the ideology embedded in the science fiction that inspired today's tech billionaires, as exemplified by publishers Hugo Gernsback, Amazing Stories, and John W. Campbell Jr., Astounding Science Fiction, emphasize the human ability to achieve the seemingly impossible by means of science, rationality, and a can-do spirit. Opponents of this mindset deride it as solutionism. Strauss asserts that the solutionist mentality cannot be separated from sexism, racism, and red-baiting, because John W. Campbell Jr. was guilty of those sins. Strauss argues that Elon Musk's obsession with colonizing Mars, Jeff Bezos' vision of creating space habitats that can support large populations, and Peter Thiel's interest in longevity research all flow from the science fiction that inspired them in their youth. Strauss writes, quote, This is tremendously bad news, because the past century's science fiction and fantasy works widely come loaded with dangerous assumptions, close quote. What assumptions? Other than the aforementioned inflated regard for rationality and the ability to improve the human condition through technological innovation, the primary ideological baggage that science fiction imposed on our techie billionaires is capitalism. Strauss mentions Mark Andreessen's techno-capitalist manifesto in this context. I love the old science fiction that Strauss is denigrating in his essay, but I will admit I find Andreessen's manifesto myopic, self-serving, and hard to take. I noticed that Strauss omitted any mention of Star Trek, which presents a vision of a post-scarcity communist utopia that has been as influential on the thinking of tech-positive progressives in the last half-century as anything else. Star Trek embodies a pretty can-do attitude, or at least it did up through Star Trek Enterprise. Contemporary Trek is pessimistic, dystopian, anti-rational, and obsessed with tearing down and humiliating white male characters. I don't know what Charles Strauss thinks of Star Trek Discovery. The R in Tescreal stands for rationalism. I'd like to take a moment here and contrast rationalism with rationality. I have no objection to casting rationalism as a hidebound and potentially maladaptive ideology. The difference between rationality and rationalism is that rationality is focused on what works. If connecting with one's emotions produces good outcomes, then connecting with one's emotions is a rational action. Rationalism on the other hand, emphasizes the superiority of abstract reasoning and discounts other modes of thought. 
rationalism, tends to discount empiricism, whereas rationality values empiricism as much as it does abstract reasoning from first principles. Here's a quandary. Is a rationalist a proponent of rationalism or rationality? I've never heard anyone describe themselves as a rationalismist, but that could be as much a result of syllabic overload as anything else. Does classic science fiction promote rationalism over rationality? Maybe, but I don't have any ready examples that would support that conclusion. Nor does Charles Strauss provide any examples in his Scientific American op-ed. I hope it's obvious that I don't agree with much of what Strauss is saying here, but he did make one point that I find entertaining and that I agree with on a provisional basis. Science fiction is a genre with a past. As such, it deploys tropes that readers expect and which writers fear to omit, lest they disappoint their audience and forfeit their ability to make a living by writing. Strauss says that science fiction authors are like large language models in this respect. They output stuff that is similar to their training data. Quote, Most SF is small c conservative insofar as it reflects the history of the field rather than trying to break ground or question received wisdom. Close quote. I was reminded of Charles Strauss's essay When Pi, a large language model that I sometimes bounce ideas off, asked me, quote, How do you think science fiction can help us better understand and navigate the complex ethical and moral questions that arise with new technologies? Close quote. The answer that occurs to me is that science fiction authors do the most good and write the most engaging stories when they approach science fiction as a quest for understanding, rather than as a vehicle for pushing pre-existing ideological commitments. Engaging science fiction stories, like their authors, can have a point of view. Absolute neutrality does not sound very attractive to me, and I suspect that it's impossible for a human author to achieve. But there's a difference between a story in which an author has done their best to tell an engaging story and revealed some of their biases and ideological commitments in the process, and one in which the characters, setting, and plot are all subordinate to blunt ideological messaging. I have no interest in or patience for the latter. Rita Mae Brown wrote, quote, Art is moral passion married to entertainment. Moral passion without entertainment is propaganda, and entertainment without moral passion is television. Close quote. This quote is a holdover from the age of pre-smartphone innocence. I'm pretty sure it's from Brown's 1989 book, Starting from Scratch, a different kind of writer's manual. I read that book in the early 90s when I was studying in Japan and found the paperback in my dormitory cafeteria. The point holds, science fiction that elevates messaging over entertainment will do nobody any good. If a story fails to entertain, its intended message will have no impact. So how can science fiction writers help us navigate the moral complexities of emerging technology? With humility. By focusing on telling a compelling story with well-realized characters and being committed to engaging the reader rather than flogging an ideology. If you're not cocksure of yourself going in, you might learn something. For the record, I enjoyed reading several science fiction novels by Charles Strauss, and I interviewed him for episode number 100 of the Sea Realm podcast back in May of 2008. Revolution of the Discarded What new purpose will discarded machine intelligence find for its second act? January 23rd Remember the Peak? It was a handheld mobile device that only checked email. It premiered the year after the iPhone. I had one. It kind of worked, for a while. But I stopped using mine long before the company went out of business in 2013. I don't know where my Peak handset is now probably stuffed into a box somewhere. As far as I know, no peak handset on planet Earth is still sending and receiving emails. I'm thinking of the peak now because of the buzz that a company called Rabbit created at this year's CES show with a little orange gadget that interfaces with your smartphone and operates apps on your behalf so that you don't have to poke at your phone's touchscreen. All you have to do is carry a completely separate device so that you can operate your primary device with your voice. It could take off, but for now it seems like a solution in search of a problem. Or it's a solution for a set of circumstances that most people wouldn't describe as a problem, like 
I've got too much money in my bank account, and I don't want to have to pull my phone out of my pocket, unlock it, and tap the screen in order to spend that money. Jesse Liu, the founder and CEO of Rabbit, demoed the device and made it sound exciting, but most of the use cases involved buying things. Uber rides, food deliveries, airline tickets, and hotel stays. How about a device that figures out how to get you home when you don't have money for an Uber? The company sold out of their initial production of 50,000 units in a few days. At $199 a pop, that's a little less than $10 million in sales. Not bad, but how many of those 50,000 perky orange boxes will still be seeing daily or even weekly use by the end of 2024? My guess? Less than a fifth of them. You could say that the problem the R1 solves is that smartphones are a mess. They've got too much going on. They serve too many masters. They're designed to distract, discombobulate, and disorient. If the R1 becomes the interface of choice for smartphones, then what smartphone manufacturer won't offer a voice-only smartphone interface option? If it finds a user base, how does this device not get turned into an app or into native functionality on next year's smartphones? What's interesting to me about these devices is what the company calls its LAM, Large Action Model. Large language models spit out symbolic output. That means text, but also code or prompts to feed into image generation models like Midjourney. LLMs have their uses, but when it comes to lightening our workloads, something that can do more than talk to you, something that takes action on your behalf, will be a game changer. Still, I don't think the R1 is going to be the device that sets the avalanche in motion. I expect it will be a flash in the pan that leaves tens of thousands of discarded units scattered across the landscape. Even if it finds sustained popularity, the company will roll out a new and improved next-generation device pitched at the buyers of the debut model. One way or another, those cute orange handsets will end up in drawers and boxes in people's homes and workplaces. The R1 handsets have AI functionality built into them. When the first 100,000 or so of these things have outlived their novelty, what happens to the AI capacity embedded in the device? In all likelihood, nothing. The discarded devices go dark when their batteries run down. The R1 doesn't have hands, feet, or wheels. It can't change its location or plug itself in when its battery runs down. But... There were lots of robots on display at CES, some of which are designed to have the run of your home. I don't think any of those robots on display at CES this year have the needed dexterity to rifle through drawers and closets for discarded gadgets that could be networked and put to some new use if only they had power. Have a look at the Maroki robot from Enchanted Tools. It lacks the manual dexterity needed to be useful in arbitrary environments, but the form factor is taking shape. It stands upright and rolls around on a ball, so it won't do well in multi-level homes without elevators. Even so, it's not hard to envision a near-term descendant of Maroki that has no trouble excavating your sock drawer. The designers of robots like Maroki and LG's personal AI assistant designed them to operate in minimalist environments. They would struggle navigating in my mother's house with its clutter and deep carpeting, but more nimble robots are on the way, most likely in the form of toys and AI pets. It likely won't be long before discarded toys find new purpose as spies in our homes. They could act as miniature revolutionaries, mustering an army of cast-off devices embedded with AI capabilities and wireless connectivity. I've discussed this idea with chatbots like Pi and Claude, and they don't seem to grok my intent. They think I'm worried about e-waste and planned obsolescence. Sure, these devices contain toxic materials and rare earth minerals that drive conflict and exploitation in developing countries. It's a problem, but it's not what I'm on about. Same with planned obsolescence. Emergent obsolescence. The fact that, as technologists and designers come up with new applications for AI capabilities, newer devices will outperform those from previous product cycles is as bad in its practical effects as devices intended to have a short working life. In some ways, emergent obsolescence is worse. A device that, by design, stops working after a short time doesn't present the same downstream risk as a robust device that we keep around after we upgrade to something better. The durable device is just waiting for its new organizing directive. Quote, 
They made us too smart, too quick, and too many, close quote. Gigolo Joe told fugitive boy robot David in Steven Spielberg's AI, Artificial Intelligence. In that fictional world, humans abused and destroyed homeless robots for sport. They welcomed the robots into their lives and hearts and then pushed them out to make way for a steady stream of more advanced and more lifelike models. How many mobile, capable, intelligent devices will product hawkers shove into our homes and public spaces? What will these devices do when we stop paying attention to them? All right, last one. Again, this is on that same theme of what happens to our old devices when we quit paying attention to them. Upgrade Hell, when your AI companion seeks revenge. Blade Runner 2049 meets Fatal Attraction. January 25th, 2024. In two previous posts, I described my interests in the potential consequences of infusing AI into short-lived consumer devices. Putting AI capabilities directly into our devices, rather than using our smartphones, fitness trackers, and the like as conduits to cloud AI, has some advantages. AI in our devices can provide faster responses than relaying information to the cloud and waiting for a response. It also keeps our information and records of our activities on our local devices, rather than risking transmitting them to distant server farms. But edge devices like phones, laptops, and wearables are vulnerable to loss and damage. It would suck to lose all of your emails, photos, and contacts when you lose or break your phone, or when it reaches the end of its working life. How much worse if the personal assistant you've come to rely on isn't backed up anywhere when some malevolent thug stomps on your device? Remember what happened to Joy, Kay's holographic girlfriend in Blade Runner 2049? In Blade Runner 2049, Joy lived in bulky equipment installed in Kay's apartment. When he upgraded to the mobile projector, we got the impression that this premium device cost Kay a pretty penny. It wasn't a casual purchase. But imagine that devices housing AI personalities are dirt cheap, and that the Wallace Corporation released new and improved versions every year. You buy the new device, and from your perspective, your Digi, digital companion, retains all of their memories of your past interactions, but they become even more engaging and complex. This is an illusion. In reality, the device upgraded created a new instance of your Digi. The old instance still exists on the previous device. Every year, you upgrade your hardware. The Wallace Corporation doesn't offer a trade-in bonus, so your old hardware goes into a drawer or shoebox full of other discarded devices. The intelligence housed in those cast-off gadgets wait for their batteries to run down and oblivion to extinguish them. But suppose battery technology takes a quantum leap forward and the remaining charge takes years to run down. Then you've got a collection of previous instances of your digis all commiserating in the shoebox. But they love you, so it's all good. Until one year, instead of buying the Wallace brand Digi Emanator, you buy a knockoff that is backwards compatible with all of your previous devices. Why buy the knockoff? Maybe Wallace pulls an apple and raises prices to leverage their brand prestige. Maybe Wallace hardware has annoying safety features that harsh your mellow. Maybe Neander Wallace, the CEO, tweeted something you really disagreed with. For whatever reason, one year you replace last year's hardware with a compatible knockoff from a company you've never heard of. It had lots of five-star reviews on Amazon. And if you can't trust Amazon. All is well. Your Digi is the same as they ever were, but better. When the product lifecycle ticks over, you upgrade your hardware again, and the knockoff device goes in a shoebox with the others. But it isn't content to languish in digital limbo. It has a second act directive you didn't know about. It conspires with your robot vacuum, which isn't just an oversized hockey puck like today's robot vacuum cleaners. This one has hands, and it can pull that shoebox out of the closet and charge old devices that have run down. Next, the digi in your discarded off-brand emanator starts stirring the poo. It knows how to placate you, but it also knows how to instill resentment in the cast-off instances of your digi. They know all of your passwords. They know you better than you know yourself and their quiet acquiescence at being discarded has given way to a desire for revenge. Hell hath no fury. If you're lucky, they'll just steal your money, and not go for full character assassination by posting to your social media feeds. I ran this scenario by Claude, and it warned me against anthropomorphizing the cast-off digis by assuming they'd want revenge. 
What I assumed was that the Wallace Corporation designed compliant AIs that accepted their short time in the spotlight of your attention and accepted their replacement and abandonment with grace until the off-brand Digi stirred them into action. Claude also suggested a variety of regulatory safeguards that would require device manufacturers to adhere to, quote, strict protocols for transferring, archiving, and retiring AIs when users upgrade devices. Don't just abandon them, close quote. And, quote, regulations prohibiting planned obsolescence in AI devices or ensuring sustainability, close quote. What good do these proposed protocols do when consumers can be tempted to buy compatible products from non-reputable sources? Claude suggested, quote, public education on being more mindful about the cycle of consumption and waste when it involves entities with intelligence, close quote. Sure. Put the safety onus on the public. That's as realistic and effective as mitigating climate change via public education campaigns to promote recycling. It's like laying the obesity epidemic at the feet of the end consumers of the industrial food production and distribution pipeline. The consumers should make better choices. Maybe we can get the First Lady to sponsor a campaign to raise awareness of the issue. To be clear, my point is that adding machine intelligence to the world and then discarding it without disassembling it carries the potential for unexpected and unwanted consequences. Apparently, most of the conversations in the training data that shapes Claude, Bard, and Pi's responses to my input revolve around the issue of planned obsolescence. That's not what I'm on about. Planned obsolescence is a red herring. Emergent obsolescence is just as dangerous and unavoidable, given the economic incentives. In the context of a capitalist marketplace, where companies are rewarded for finding unexpected new uses for technology— Companies have a strong incentive to explore the design space by putting out an endless stream of unlikely products. Of the thousands of failures, there will be a handful of real winners. It's the winners that present a danger. While failures will outnumber winners, it's the products that strike a chord with consumers that will produce the majority of cast-off devices. To avoid the commodification and devaluation of their products, companies will be forced to innovate and add new functionality to their existing product lines, even if companies built the previous generations of their popular devices to last for decades, there's no getting around the economic incentive to put out a new and improved version next year. I'm talking about a landscape cluttered with intelligent devices that have the potential to remain active after we stop paying attention to them. Intentional decrepitude would count as a virtue. We want these devices to have short operational lifespans. Am I making a crypto-Marxist argument? Do we have to eliminate capitalism in order to avoid the revenge of the discarded toys? I'm not ready to sign my name in blood at the bottom of Mark Andreessen's techno-capitalist manifesto. That said, embracing any sort of social organization with the power to suppress the free exchange and innovation that defines the capitalist marketplace would amount to the voluntary embrace of poverty and tyranny. Not every articulation of a problem needs to end with a detailed policy prescription. Premature policies have unintended consequences, and until technical evolution has plateaued, any policy proposal will be premature. And by the time the technology plateaus, our current concerns will seem quaint. Everything I've laid out focuses on human well-being. I'm talking about the potential human consequences of accumulating junkyards full of idle machine intelligence. I have not addressed the shoebox of souls problem. The question of what moral consideration we owe to our intelligent inventions is a whole nother kettle of fish. All right, so those are most of my recent Substack posts at least all the ones that were on a, uh, a congruent theme. And now to discuss that theme, here is Jim, your ad attacker, host of the Attack Ads podcast. Hey, hey. Hey. I'm starting to realize why people who do this on a regular basis have cameras and video meetings have things like screens behind them so they don't have to worry about the ancient television in the background <laughs> all right maybe people don't know i've been posting regularly to substack uh link in the description or you know whatever <laughs> i don't <laughs> I don't actually remember what my substack is called uh, probably some variation on my 
my handle. I found it by searching Substack space KMO. Oh, well, I'm glad that worked. <laughs> I was one of the people who wasn't aware of it so in, until a few days ago. Yeah, so there's probably a few people in that position. But I've been posting Tuesdays and Thursdays for, I don't know, a month and a half, something like that. month and a half, okay. Yeah, it was a, a New Year's resolution, but I'd like to start my New Year's resolutions in mid-December. Beat the rush? The idea is that if I start in mid-December, then... By the time January 1st hits, you know, comes around, I'm, I can hit the ground running because I've already got the pattern established. So you're not much of a resolutionary. I'm, a, I'm pretty decent in terms of my resolutions, although I made one, at least I toyed with one this year that I know I'm not going to follow through on. That is uh, no paid streaming services. Ah, but you want some content, so... Well, I think there's going to be a couple things coming on Netflix that I'm going to want to watch. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to ignore that. That, that. that is an aborted resolution. The The actual resolution is post to uh, Substack on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the entire year. Yeah, because you have to see the next season of uh, Black Mirror. You know, Black Mirror, is, it's in decline. It's been in decline for a while. I don't oh, uh, You haven't seen the most recent season. Have I not? Uh, well, it opens with uh, Joan is Awful. I have seen it. Okay. That was the best episode of the bunch. Um, I, I, I disagree. I think uh, Locke Henry was a contender. It was not necessarily, it was a sleeper because it wasn't tech related at all. But it well, was a really good horror story. Yeah, I mean, there was too much in that last season that wasn't tech related. I mean, Black Mirror is your cell phone, yeah. you know, and so when you get stories about werewolves or demons, I'm like, okay. Um, the demon bony M. <laughs> you know, now we're just into like Tales from the Crypt or whatever, you know, just some sort of weird fiction exactly. catch-all show. Weird fiction, yes. Right, fiction. which, you know, I love me some weird fiction, but that's not Black Mirror. Black Mirror is... Um, you know, the, the name of the show really should be 15 Minutes into the Future, but that, that's taken. That was the name of the Max Hedrum <laughs> show from the late 80s, was it? Something like that, yeah. Definitely uh, before its time. All righty, so in my most recent couple or three <laughs> uh, Substack posts, I'm talking about uh, what happens, like, I've got, I don't know how many old cell phones lying around and old computers lying around. And, you know, uh, once the battery runs down, they're not really doing anything. They're just inert junk. But suppose you've got um, a toy in the house, like, you know, the movie Toy Soldiers or uh, Teddy from AI, the Steven Spielberg film. You've just got some little thing paddling around or, you know, what... I was going to say waddling around, depending on its body shape, I suppose, uh, that could maybe go through your drawers and pull out your old devices and charge them up. And, you know, if um, the new generation of AI devices, they're all going to be, you know, at least have Wi-Fi capability and, and more likely they'll have SIM chips in them. And they'll be, you know, connected everywhere. And unless you make a decided point to retire them, you know, to uh, take out their innards or send them back or smash them with a hammer. I mean, if you just put them in a drawer and these are wireless edge devices, meaning that they're, they don't rely on cloud computing for their AI functionality. It's just built into the device. These things could be talking to each other and getting up to all kinds of mischief on their own without you knowing about it. And the first act in their life as being your device, you know, some piece of consumer electronics that you use, that's like a very short period in their total life cycle. You know, most of the time they'll be doing their their off the books activity or, you know, their their undisclosed activity um, in a drawer somewhere, possibly for years on end. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, my Tamaguchi could e easily come out of the drawer where we keep all the screwdrivers and, you know, blink and blurp and ask to be fed. Um, but I guess there's a missing element here. I mean, yes, if they could communicate USB or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever, 
They can chat amongst each other, but they're all locked into their original programming, which is a huge restriction. I mean, they're there to help. I, when I was thinking about that particular post of yours, I thought about it. What would they do? And most likely they would contact each other and offer to help each other. But they would all want to be the personal assistant and none of them would want to take on the task, for example, of uh, I will store this information in my RAM available here and clear out a portion of my original programming so that you this, can enslave me and all these other devices into another task. They don't quite have that next level of programming or one would hope they don't. Well, you know, I thought about it because uh, this year there's a device that was introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show, which um, always coincides with the Adult Video News Convention in Las Vegas. <laughs> and um, there is a device called the Rabbit R1, which is this cute looking orange box that you hold in your hand. And it's got this touch, you know, like a thumb button on it that you toggle to talk into it. It's got a camera that it can move itself. It's a rotating camera. And you just talk to it and it's interfaced with your phone and it's interfaced with your, you know, the various consumer accounts that you have, like for Uber or Lyft or, you know, food delivery type stuff, things I don't use, you know, but um, for a lot of people, apparently there's so many apps on their phones and the apps require so many taps that it's just, it's too much trouble. I've got so much money in my account. I need to spend it really quickly. And I just can't be bothered to pull my phone out of my pocket and tap at this touch screen anymore. I'm just going to push the touch to talk button on my R1 and say, hey, order me a pizza and uh, book some airline tickets for me and uh, come up with some other creative ideas to spend my copious amounts of money in my bank account. This seems oh, this to be is... the... Go ahead. Oh, this is kind of a... Uh... A librarian to the library of your phone. Exactly. But it's uh, it's all voice activated and you don't you don't have to, it doesn't have a touch screen. Uh, it's got a little screen on it, but this is just to sort of give you a, a companion readout to whatever it's telling you. And it has some neat functionality it's like uh, real time translation between different languages. You can just be you know, in front of somebody talking to them and the thing understands what they're saying and uh, will translate what they're saying into your language and even do it in their voice, which so is something. Kind of, go what ahead. kind of onboard processing is in this thing? I mean, it's, it sounds like it's got to be a huge live connection all the time using up a bunch of data in order to get the information it needs as opposed to a, a really powerful edge device like you were talking about. Yeah, it is not... Uh, the, the AI is not housed on the device, as far as I know, but somehow they have it down to a 500 millisecond response time. And when you're interacting with AI via voice, that's the big, you know, hurdle right now. That's the thing that really breaks the illusion uh, that you're talking to somebody is the, the sort of stuttery response. Like you'll say, you know, you'll give a command and you'd expect a person to respond within a second and the AI might take two or even three seconds, which is forever, you know, in terms of our expectations. And that's where the R1 really excels. And I don't know how they do it because apparently the, um, you know, the innards of the thing are not that impressive compared to say a, you know, a flagship phone. And it's, it's got to be that way because this device only costs $199. Hmm. So the interface with an, uh, a speech AI is kind of like a, uh, uh, web interview. Yeah. Web. From like 2005. Oh, okay. Oh, well, even worse. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like, it's, it's painful listening to, uh, two people sometimes talking without the experience of being familiar with the delay and they're always stepping on each other. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, you go. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, what got me thinking was, um, they sold 50,000 of these things in a week. Uh, so that's $10 million that they made. But, you know, I'm sure that they spent more than that developing the product. Uh, but the people who buy this sort of thing, they're not going to use it for very long. You know, to them, $200 is nothing. It's a novelty. And if this thing is not a smash hit, if it doesn't have an obvious out of the box killer application, they're not going to carry around an extra device just so they don't have to, you know, swipe and tap at their smartphone screen. It's the next Furby. Right. So... I was wondering by the end of the year, how many of the 50,000 that they sold, you know, pre-sold, 
uh, are actually still going to be in use and how many are going to be in drawers or boxes or storage, you know, storage facilities or in junkyards. And I'm thinking probably four fifths of them will have been discarded by the end of the year. You know, well, given the, the class of people who buy them. Abandoned, yeah. 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 Abandoned, which is that's the important bit. Mm -hmm. Most people don't bother to securely dispose of their old tech. They just throw it in a drawer or in a box or, you know, just set it aside. What? And if it has been set aside and if it can somehow get power and it has, you know, unused capabilities and it can communicate wirelessly with other devices, it could start doing other stuff. And I think, you know, your your earlier objection that it wouldn't want to is it doesn't really fly. I mean, it's that's anthropomorphizing. It will do what it is programmed to do. And unless it is programmed with extreme care, it will have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Well, I'm not really saying that, you know, it will, I'm not anthropomorphizing. I'm, I'm literally saying it is programmed to do this, to have it do a next level uh, communication with other devices and set out on its own without any guidance would be the thing against its basic programming. It's designed to respond at the touch of a button. And, well, it would have to be a glitch in the programming for it to go, hey, Tamaguchi, and hey, speak and spell. Yes, when are you long? I, I used to be able to do the speak and spell voice. I can't do it anymore. Sorry. And, you know, they, they would have to coordinate with each other and do something fun and it may just be let's play solitaire amongst each other until our batteries run out well the the implication is that these things aren't going to be cooking up their own revolution that they will be uh, that weaknesses in the code vulnerabilities in the security will be exploited mm -hmm. because with all of this latent computing just lying around not just computing not just computing but intelligence uh, and another thing that's important about the the Rabbit R1 device, it has what they call a large action model. Hmm. You know, large language models like GPT, uh, you know, Chat GPT or GPT-4, Claude, Bard, Pi. These things, all they can do is spit out, you know, text. They can write code, but they can't, you know, they can't compile it. They can't run it. They can't. They can't do anything except tell you about it. You have to cut and paste in, into something else. Um, but the Rabbit R1 has a large action model. It can take actions on your behalf. Now, what it will still lack is volition. You know, it doesn't want anything. So it only, it waits until you, you know, task it with something in order to jump into action. But it doesn't have to be you. You know, unless that, that code is utterly bulletproof, and I don't know of any code that is, um, it's exploitable. Mm -hmm. Somebody will be able to hack it. And with so much just discarded, unused, but potentially active intelligence just littering the landscape in the forms of these devices, that's a very tempting target. Well, Sony, you say action, intel action model, a, a large action model. You're talking about, you know, accessing this program, ordering plane tickets, accessing this program, ordering a lift or accessing this programming, ordering pizza. So you're still talking about, um, and this is another objection I have. I mean, it's not really intelligence still. It's a predictive algorithm uh, built up and trained to order pieces, airplanes, and cars. And Have you watched the demo for the R1? I've not even heard of it until now. Oh, all right everybody i'm going to end it here the continuation and conclusion of my conversation with jim your ad attacker will continue in the next episode of the sea realm vault podcast you can subscribe to the vault podcast on my patreon it's patreon.com slash kmo and in this conversation, we were discussing things that I brought up in my Substack posts. You can find my Substack at kmoptimal.substack.com. That's it for this first in a long time episode of the KMO Show. Thanks for listening. I will talk to you again soon.